I'm Dr. Greg Winteregg, CEO of the Private Dentist Alliance. I want to talk to all of you students out there today who are wondering what your future is going to be like as a career in dentistry, as an assistant, as a hygienist, as a dentist, where is this profession going with the rapid increase of the DSO movement? I'm here to tell you the PDA is going to help you and I want you to become a member today. It is free. Now, why should you become a member? You're going to get weekly video updates from me and you're going to get regular updates of our newsletters from the Alliance on exactly what is happening and how we are going to help preserve and protect the private practice of dentistry. Now to me, the most important advantage is you are going to get access to our job board. What is that? Our private practicing members all have access to our PDA job board, which means if they have an opening in their private practice of assistant, hygienist, doctor, front office staff, they're going to be able to post it. And you're going to be able to check up regularly. And as our membership grows, we're going to be covering larger and larger territories across the United States. If you are looking for a job in any position in the office of a private practice, you need to become a student member today. It is free. Go to www.privatedental.org and become a student member today. You're going to love your benefits. Do it now. What is up, guys? It's your boy, Matt Havis, back at it with the Dental Student Vibes podcast. And today we have a really cool interview for you. We have, we have Dr. Eric Holmgren. He's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon based out of Massachusetts. And today he sits down for us in the first part of his two-part interview to discuss all things getting into oral surgery residency, what to expect, everything that you can do to prepare for you know the whole uh, interview process, residency, and the best strategies that you can use to get in to maximize your chances. You don't want to miss this if you're headed into a specialty, if you really want to understand the ins and outs of an oral surgery residency, this is the interview to listen to. We wish you guys the best. Follow us on Instagram at dental.student.vibes. And as always, stay safe and vibe on. Welcome back to another episode of the Dental Student Vibes podcast. I'm Seth and I'm here today with the man with the plan. He's, he's, got, he's up to something, Dr. Eric Holmgren. Dr. Eric, how are you today? Good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Eric, you've got uh, an interesting story. Uh, we talked beforehand. You're in Western Massachusetts. You also have a practice or you're teaching in Dartmouth. Can you kind of bring us up to speed here? How did you get how did you start out? Um, how did your journey go from dental school to residency with oral surgery and to where you are today? I know that's a big question, but let's yeah. just dive right in. Yeah, I'll give you a little background. Um, so I uh, uh, grew up in California and um, went to uh, school in Santa Barbara and I studied engineering and I thought that was my path. And um, what ended up happening is that my family ended up moving to the East Coast in Vermont. I was kind of stuck out in California and I didn't really know what to do other than had an interest in medicine and dentistry. And I thought, well, let's just go to University of Vermont and, and kind of figure this out. And so I was doing some you know, bioengineering studies and involved with medicine. And um, my dad was golfing with a bunch of happy dentists. And I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. You know, I always thought it would be cool to have my own little business. And I kind of like tinkering a little bit and a lot of mechanical things and materials and biomechanics and and maybe ortho or something you know so I just I kind of started to think about that but so I ended up finishing um, my graduate studies and then I sort of was longing again to go back to California and and I had an, an internship and a job offer at uh, Qualcomm I don't know if you've probably heard of yeah, it uh, Qualcomm so, huge company yeah yeah I was actually employee under a thousand wow. um, and I started there in 95 as an engineer and it was, it was actually pretty small. And I found myself sitting in a cubicle at age 22 going, hmm, is this my life? And Qualcomm at the time was struggling a little bit in terms of trying to get its patents out. And I, I didn't think it was gonna be this 
huge company and I'd, I was worried that I would be canned because there were some other things happening. And then I said, you know, I, I don't think I can do this. You know, I had all my pre-med requirements. So I, um, I ended up having my wisdom teeth out and um, I befriended the oral surgeon because he lived actually like two blocks down from my grandmother and I kind of knew him. And then we went out for tacos <laughs> and it just sort of, I don't know, he was just a cool guy, you know, he goes to Hawaii a lot and, and I just went to his practice and I was like, you know, let's just apply to dental school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Where. It, yeah. And well, I mean, you know, I had an interest, so let's apply because, you know, then I can sort of like go there and interview and sniff around and get a sense of whether this is my tribe, you know, like, Good. and um, I ended up getting an interview at, at Penn and I'll tell you, I went there and I'd never been to Philly before. But my interview was with the program director of oral surgery, who act, uh, um, Norman Betts, who actually played tight end for University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Totally cool guy. And we just kind of hit it off. And then I, I ran into the dean, who was uh, Dean Fonseca, who's just like this world famous oral surgeon. And I'm like, yeah, this, maybe this is the place. This is kind of cool. And then just a lot of reflection. And I just decided to just do it. And um, so I sold my company shares at Qualcomm. Mm -hmm to pay for dental school, lo and behold, they, you know, went up to 700 and split and went up again and split. And my shares ended up, ended up being worth a million dollars, but I sold it for 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of regret in that, but in reflection, I think I still made the right decision because I'm in a better place financially than I would have been anyways if I stayed there. So that's how I, my journey to, to, to Penn and dental school. And then um, to make a, you know, long story short, um, our dean at the time recommended that all first years just come in and chat with him about, you know, who you are, what you want to do. And he kind of sat back and said, you know, maybe you should go do an externship in New Orleans uh, after your uh, sophomore year and I'll help set that up in oral surgery. And I'm like, cool, I've never been to New Orleans. So I went down to, to Charity Hospital before it got taken away by the hurricane, mm -hmm. you know, six or five, four or whatever. Um, and then my passion for oral surgery started there. I, I just found myself that I was more of an uh, acute kind of guy. Like, let's just take the tooth out. I felt, I felt better about it. Instead of, you know, doing, doing a little burnishing of some fillings, I just was like, I don't know. I just didn't have the patience. And it just sort of jived with me more to the hospital environment. So that's how I ended up applying for oral surgery. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That, that's incredible. So um, when you were going through that process, so you said, like, you liked extractions. Now let's, let's talk a little bit more about when you were in dental school. Cause a lot of our listeners are, you know, yeah. students, recent grads, all that. So what were some other things um, that drove you in the direction of oral surgery? And then also I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. Cause I'm eager to ask you a ton of questions. Yeah. Well, I think I wanted to go into dental school um, more of an open book. Like I said, I, I kind of was, you know, more leaning towards specialty um, versus being a generalist. Um, and I thought, you know, mechanically, just because my background, I was like, ah, ortho and bending wires and just kind of, you know, having a little little business, you know, and running my own show. Um, but I just, it's funny, you know, I tell a lot of my, uh, you know, I, a lot of the medical students I coach who are first years and a lot of, um, you know, I have a lot of students that shadow me too. And, you know, I tell them who are applying to dental school or med school and and, um, you know, it feels like a Forrest Gump type of thing where you just sort of like float, the, you know, follow the feather a little bit or whatever, you know, the end of that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, it, it's more of an intrinsic kind of gut feel as you go through the different specialties, you kind of look around at the people who are involved in those specialties and you're like, is this my tribe? Or is this not my tribe? And then as you're doing the procedures, do you, do you feel like, oh, I can't wait till I'm done with this. I, I got to do something else. Or when you go home, do you reflect on like, you know, how that procedure was, or you can't stop thinking about it. Or, you know, I would listen to that sort of intrinsic feel that you have and, and go with it. Don't, don't like try to squash it. And for me, you know, unfortunately, it, it just was oral surgery that kind of resonated with me, even though I tried to really embrace other specialties. Um, and I say, unfortunately, because it's just kind of a long journey. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm glad at the end of the day, um, you know, I chose that. So 
I want to think that it was like super calculated, but it was really mainly sort of a gut intrinsic feel. And then just kind of being lucky to have um, some cool experiences and, you know, a little bit of mentorship that kind of pushed me along. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And right. yeah. I, I think one of the things very interesting, I've never heard somebody actually say this, but you just did about, is this my tribe regarding the specialties? And, yeah. you know, I've never really been cognizant about that, but that's so true. You're, you're really looking around who's doing what and, like, like the saying goes, you, you are the sum of the five people around you, right? Yeah. So exactly. Perhaps that was one of the things that you were thinking. Uh, yeah. You know, I want to be like these people, or, you know, that sort of thing. So I think yeah. that's very important, especially, um, you know, that's what we try to do here, Dental Student Vibes. We try to bring the best of the best and just dive right in and be surrounded by the best. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, listen to that and look around the room and, and see if you belong or you feel like you belong and, and, you know, cause you're, you're this is going to be your life, you know, and you're going to go to meetings and you're going to, you know, in, you know, mingle with these people and you're, you're going to be reading about, you know, and, and if you're proud to be a part of that and, and like the people you're around, that's important. And I kind of felt that with just, you know, a lot of people in dentistry, but just sort of resonated a little more with oral surgery residents. And I don't know, maybe it was just, you know, me being like, you know, my mid twenties and that's what I was thinking at the time, but I think it still holds true. Cause I'm still really, really good friends. I say my best friends are people who I did residency with, you know, and we just, you know, when we, we don't talk or see each other like a lot, but when we see each other, it's like we had just seen each other the next day, you know, the experience mm -hmm. went through and, and, uh, and we're all on the same page. So it's, it's kind of cool to, I don't know, think yeah. like that, I guess. I, I totally agree with you. And perhaps you're saying like with residency, I'm assuming I, I I've heard from others, you know, how difficult residency residency can be at times. I had the same experience um, in my master's degree at USF. One of the hardest, toughest programs, um, like, you know, studying like 11, 12, 14 hours a day, every single day of the week. Um, but like those have become some of my best friends. And it's like, when I meet up with them, it's like no days have passed. Yeah, so, exactly. So yeah. another question I want to ask you is um, at that point, so now looking back now, what is one piece of advice that you would give yourself uh, when you're about to graduate? From dental school? From dental school. Oh, um, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I looked at the end of dental school as just sort of a panic kind of rush, sort of very chaotic time. Um, and I was so eager just to move on to the next thing. Um, we should have just sort of relished the time a little bit and sort of embraced my fourth year um, a little bit more and just maybe sort of wallowed a little bit in you know what I accomplished and what I did at dental school and how much I grew. I, I, grew. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of raced out of there. I was so eager to just move on. Um, so maybe just to you know just sort of take it slow and wallow, especially if you know you've, if you have a plan afterwards. There's no hurry or rush. Just kind of take your time and take take a deep breath and enjoy your last moments of right. being in dental school. Do you think you had like that grass is greener mentality? Like once I start practicing or once I get out? Yeah. Well, I think for me, I was, I was pretty anxious cause I had needed to move across country to, to Portland, Oregon. And um, my wife was with us and we were just so eager and just anxious. And I was just really nervous as heck to start this crazy path. And, and I was like, Ugh. And I just wish I would have chilled out a little bit and, and sort of rolled into it a little more mellow than, than all amped up. Right. Um, yeah. So what was your fourth year like? Was it like, uh, I'm, I'm a D3, by the way. So yeah, okay. your fourth year, was it um, just all clinical or you still had classes? How was that? Yeah, it was pretty much all clinical. And, you know, I graduated in 2000. So I'm like, <laughs> um but you know, we had a pen as we were, it was, you know, nothing like it is now. It's like, imagine like we had these green, like really ugly smocks that were all kind of wrinkled. <laughs> we would just wear them. And, and then we had this one hall with no, it was a huge hall that was just all dental chairs and no barriers. And, and um, it just was so stressful just trying to get the requirements down and, and um, um, yeah, we just, it was pretty much 
all clinical and we had a few classes. It, it was, yeah, it was just kind of a clinical grind, just getting your requirements done. Um, and uh, I wish I had more memories of it. I don't, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. But I actually had a lot more time off and it was great once I figured out where I was going. It was like very nice to not really have to stress out about my, my future too much. Right. So now moving to the next steps, tell me about when you started entering residency and I don't know really anything about oral surgery residency. So can you tell me what you have to do to get accepted to oral surgery? And mm -hmm. then also what is it like day to day for however many years you did that for? Yeah, good question. So uh, oral surgery, I think um, is, I don't think it's changed too much. I mean, I've, I've written some recommendations and, and um, uh, I've, I work with uh, at UCSF Fresno, actually their oral surgery program. I do, I go out there once or twice a year and adjunct teach um, just cause my residency buddies run this program. And when they go away, they ask me to sometimes come and fill in, which I love. And um, it hasn't really changed that much. I think um, one of the things is, you know, showing a, a passion for oral surgery and a willingness to, you know, work four to six years beyond dental school. I think having that, um, you know, mentality um, you know, demonstrating that. Um, the other thing is, you know, doing well in your classes and, you know, doing well in your boards and so forth is, is important. Um, I don't think it's, you know, terribly crucial that you like completely ace it. Um, one of the things I found is, you know, when you do externships is I find that to be the most valuable thing is showing up and just regardless of your background and your scores, being able to blend in, work as a team, and actually show a lot of work ethic. Um, I find that one thing I was told is when you go on externships, be um, the first person there and the last person to leave and not to be, you know, quiet and kind of nerdy, but somewhat speak when spoken to, just sort of play in the background and then just, you know, help out, but don't be overbearing. You know, it's sort of like a dance, you know, almost like a first date, you know, that you can, <laughs> someone that you really like. Um, so, you know, you have to really blend in with the personality, really be a team player, help out the interns, don't overspeak the, the senior resident, if you, even if you know the question. I mean, it's, you know, some common sense kind of blending in. And I tell you, that goes really, really far. And like, man, that guy was such a hard worker and such a cool guy to hang out with. And he really helped us out a lot. And man, he worked hard. Oh, his board scores were a little low. I don't know. I still think that guy would be a great oral surgeon. You know, like, I think yeah. that is important. So, um, that for me would be the, the most important thing um, in terms of, you know, getting in and then, you know, applying to a bunch of schools. And then in terms of the match process, um, at least having 10 interviews that you can rank, I think statistically, even for the, the medical residents, like I do uh, interview a Dartmouth uh, ear, nose and throat residency program. I interview medical students who are applying for ENT. And I think even across medical school and dental school for residencies, if you can rank 10 places that you interviewed at you're statistically going to get in mm -hmm. um, so to getting at least 10 interviews and ranking 10 interviews is probably key statistically um, right that's some great advice especially about um or blending in and just kind of falling in line with how the residents are are working and the chief resident and everything that you're saying i've heard yeah. that a lot so the scores and that stuff is kind of just the filter and then to get chosen, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a core group sort of thing, right? Yeah. 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 Just again, fitting in with the tribe and being a team player and, and learning your place and, and working up as you, as you, as you get more educated and get older. And um, yeah, I think that's important. Right. So how was the day to day then? So let's, let's just say like fast forward, like a year in. So what's, what are you doing every day? And then also, how does that change to the, the end of your residency? So, you know, I think, you know, whether you're choosing the medical de degree track or the just, you know, four-year OMS track, um, for me, I, um, you know, applied just for the medical degree track. And, and um, I think my process was I, I just felt like it, you, you can never be overeducated. Um, and I was willing to spend the extra two years and jump through the extra hoops of passing the medical boards and going to med school and 
doing a year of general surgery. I was kind of willing and sort of excited to just, you know, do that and accomplish that. Um, but if you are like, I don't want to take med boards and do all that, then four year track is great. I mean, you know, you can do anything as a four year or six year. So I think it's, it's a little bit muddy, but, um, you know, some of the best oral surgeons in our specialty are four year, four year grads. So, um, I think deciding that, but, and it differs a little bit. I think, you know, for me, I spent, you know, two years, two and a half years in med school and a year of general surgery. And, and so that day to day is different, um, in that you're in med school and you don't really have to do, you know, like you just have to pass <laughs> and you just, you know, and which is kind of fun. And then you moonlight a little bit as an oral surgeon and, or, you know, dentist pulling teeth and, um, so it's different, but it's a four year, I think, especially at Fresno where I, where I work, you know, there's a lot of work and uh, four years are pretty, pretty grind. I mean, you can work 68 hours in some rotations. Um, I think that, you know, your third and fourth year or four year program, you're really operating a lot and, you know, it's tiresome and you look forward to getting out. Um, but again, you're with a lot of colleagues. There's a lot of fun to be had. Everyone's working as hard and you kind of share that. So um, I think day to day in general, I would say that you're working really hard, taking care of patients, um, hanging out with your co-residents and, um, and yeah, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question completely, does, but yeah, definitely. It's a lot of hard work, but at the same time, it's fun. Some of the fondest memories I have in my specialty is, is just being a resident, you know, like watching my chief resident do stuff and him making fun of me of doing something. And we still talk about that stuff or making fun of attendings and, some of the hospital scenarios and patients we saw, like I still reflect a lot on what I learned as a resident. And so just kind of that, like, I don't know, that military kind of feel of, I don't know. I just felt like I haven't been to Iraq, but with a group of guys, but I felt like, you know, I don't know. I just, that was my military experience, my boot camp, Right. And, and everyone's working hard. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think fond of those times. Okay. So what were some of like the, uh, procedures that you would see a lot of the treatments did you see a lot of trauma because i've heard people that said like they get a ton of just trauma and then others say that they're just doing a bunch of extractions so how yeah. is that well i think that's one of the things when you're if where your interest lies there's programs that uh, have a, a bent towards you know certain types of oral surgery procedures um, for me, I, I, I was more interested in going to a program that you just had to really roll up your sleeves and just really get in the thick of things. Um, where I went was more head and neck cancer reconstruction and, and trauma related. And that was exciting to me. And so as a first year, we were doing mainly, you know, ER trauma stuff and head and neck cancer stuff. And the traditional oral surgery stuff was more on the, the back end of things, uh, so that was more of a priority there and that they just needed manpower to handle it. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know, I, I really think of um, a lot of programs nowadays have a nice balance. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's key. And that's what you'll find out when you're, if you go visit is what's your balance. That's kind of what you really want. You don't want like 90% like head and neck cancer because right. you know, really, are you going to do that? Uh, you would like a balance just to be exposed to everything and feel comfortable with everything. Um, so I think a lot of first and second years being in clinic, doing extractions and dental alveolar procedures and learning IV sedation and assisting in the OR and then chief residents doing more complex cases um, now that they feel more comfortable with dental alveolar surgery. I think that's a nice program um, and there's plenty out there like that. Right. So you, you just brought up um, IV sedation. What are your thoughts? This kind of a little twist here but what are your thoughts on uh general dentists taking all these IV uh courses and um do you think that that's kind of where the future is going with IV sedation and dentistry yeah um i i think that um you know it's interesting you know if you feel that your practice um really needs that and that's going to be a value to your patients and you've had the training and feel comfortable doing it, um, you know, go for it. And if it's within the bounds of your state in terms of licensure and you're able to do that, um, I think that's great. Um, I do feel like, uh, you know, having done 
15,000 IV sedation so far in my career that, you know, I did five today. Yeah. And I still worry, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Um, so how important is that to you? And is that sedation and your worry and that benefit to that patient really worth that? Can I sleep at night? Am I doing the right thing? Um, so I think you have to really consider that in the bottom line. Um, I think sometimes too, a lot of, a lot of people underestimate the value of developing rapport with patients who have anxiety and who mm -hmm. may need sedation. Um, and so, you know, building confidence and rapport with a patient uh, may obviate the need for someone to really need sedation. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of what I have to say about that. I think that yeah, I got you. So the thing that I got from it is like that you've done 15,000, but you still have that in the back of your mind. Could something go wrong? Yeah. And, yeah. and so how, how are you going to feel when something goes wrong and you feel you're ill prepared? Um, and that can happen with anesthesia yeah. <laughs> all the time. And is that, is that worth it? Um, and, um, but nowadays, you know, bringing a CRNA in, um, you know, for more complex full mouth rehabs and the responsibility sort of taken off of you somewhat, I think that's a, a really nice, nice way to go too. Um, definitely, definitely. Okay, so back to the residency. So what was like um, something that you wish you did more, like a regret that you had uh, that you didn't do during residency? <sighs> ah, super interesting. Um, Yeah, when I uh, when I came out, um, I felt um, honestly a little bit ill prepared for just the day to day oral surgery practice. I, I was, you know, I I wish I had spent more time learning about the nuances of private practice because I jumped into private practice just thinking, oh, I'll figure this out. I'm like, wow, I'm I'm not really trained for this. I'm more of like a hospital guy, um, and that took me quite a while just to get used to patient flow and. Um, more of a dental alveolar clinic, which I kind of just fell into. Um, I think implants, even back when I graduated, were, I don't know, compared to what I'm doing now versus 2006, is just feels night and day still, you know, like guided implants, cone beam, full mouth, you know, like, man, it wasn't even really happening in my world. Um, so uh, I don't want to say like, I wish I did more implants because a lot of that stuff, you know, can change year to year. It was just more of dealing with patient flow and private practice environment. I wish I would have, you know, stepped into that or spend more time learning about that. Mm -hmm. I don't regret doing all the big stuff I did, you know, big surgeries, big traumas, because I've seen it all. I feel like from the head and neck. And so any complications that I potentially could have, I feel very comfortable because, okay, this is nothing like I've done before. And so that, you know, that's comforting to have that big surgery type of exposure. So you felt like you got all of that um, during just residency, like that you've seen everything after you had gotten out. Yeah. I, yeah. Definitely from a trauma and head neck experience. That's I mean, awesome. that for me was like, okay, if I've got an intraoral bleed from something I did, I got it. You know, like, yeah. I got this, right. <laughs> you know, just cause of what else I've seen. So that, I think again, it, it harks back to like, it's better to be overtrained than undertrained. And so um, it's hard to read about those experiences. You just have to experience in them with, with attendings and people you respect. And, and I think just learning hands-on is, is key. Yeah, that's, that's great. Cause I feel like a lot of people who are looking to go into oral surgery, they're hesitant because it's just kind of like, you're just opening Pandora's box. There's so many more things that like can go wrong and just so many other procedures and all of that. So it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, okay. Um, we do have a listener question asked, um, what uh, is one piece of advice you would give? Because I have a, a bunch of friends that are uh, in oral sur or going into oral surgery and they, they want to know what's a piece of advice that you would give them uh, before going into oral surgery? Before um, entering the residency. Before entering the residency? Right. Um, like they're committed hundred percent to going to oral surgery yeah, or yeah. doing it. So what to do beforehand. Right. Um, and just kind of like, you know, in their first year, just, yeah. Yeah. I think starting at, starting and running, you know, like, I mean, really, I mean, just 
read your oral surgery book. <laughs> you know, like, really just have some basic knowledge. Um, right. And, you know, gosh, I don't know what your extraction requirements are, but yeah, if you can, if you can, um, you know, feel comfortable with your blocks and dental obvious folders and extractions, um, read about how to write notes on, you know, in the hospital, help your, inter help your, your co-interns or your residents, you know, I think if you come in running and so people don't have to babysit and overlook you a lot, um, you'll, you'll gain confidence and they'll also gain confidence in you and you'll be put sort of on a fast track to really get a lot out of oral surgery. If you come in sort of really wet behind the ears and a little nervous and scared and you're spending an hour to take out a molar and you're constantly asking for help, um, that's going to really, people are going to be like, oh, you know, I, I think that's, that's going to be tough mm -hmm. um, on, on your, on your psyche, on your confidence. And you're also going to question, am I right for this? Um, everybody has to go through that. Oh my God, I spent two hours taking out a molar and someone had to, and someone had to rescue me. I can't get this person numb. Right. Like I'll be honest with you. I came out of residency two years into private practice. I couldn't get someone numb. And I had to ask my older partner. I'm like, I'm sorry. Can you get this person numb for me? He went in little drop. Of, he just did a little, you know, one car building and she was numb. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. So like everybody has to struggle. Everyone's going to make mistakes and you know, it's better to, you know, go through a few of those mistakes and learn so that you can, you know, learn from that and, and not do too much of that. Your first exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just do as many extractions as you can gotcha. and read so okay. that you go and run. Okay. Any, um, well, we'll get later on into like books and podcasts, all that sort of stuff that you like, but so specifically for those oral surgery residents, what is a good book that you like? Oh yeah. Um, OMFS secrets, Abubakar. Um, and, uh, his second version out, I believe I had that, uh, that my first secrets book was highlighted and so grubby. Mm -hmm. um, just going through everything. I think that's important. Um, you know, the Peterson, um, I still have Peterson kind of oral surgery, you know, one-on-one books. I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. I just think principles of oral surgery. Gotcha. Um, honestly, not a lot has changed elevator forcep, <laughs> you know, youth anatomy yeah. technique, um, you know, types of impactions and what you would do. Um, Omifa Secrets would, is huge. Oh, so I could okay. read that. Cool. And then um, with, by Abu Bakr um, from, from Virginia. All right, guys. That'll do it for the first part of our interview series with Dr. Eric Holmgren, oral and maxillofacial surgeon based in Massachusetts. So we hope you guys enjoyed this. Got a wealth of information. We really enjoyed having him on for this first part. We hope you guys can respond, give us some questions, reach out to us and see what other specialists you'd like to have on if anyone is curious about going into a residency. If you have a certain specialty you want to hear more about, let us know. We'd love to have that for you guys. Let's make this the best podcast we can for you. Get you guys all that high yield information that you guys want so bad. So as always, follow us on Instagram at dental.student.vibes. Share with a friend. Give us a like, comment, a follow, any of that stuff. And stay tuned for uh, part two coming out soon. And stay safe and vibe on.